Well, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm Peter Jennings, the Executive Director of ASPE, and we're very pleased to welcome our virtual audience, a small hand-selected uh, audience of uh, ASPE folk uh, here at our offices, to launch part one of the cost of defence. Uh, let me hold this very handsome volume up here by, uh, by Marcus Hedia. Uh, and um, given the um, stringencies of uh, COVID uh, and the impact that this has had on the federal budget, we are actually breaking uh, new ground. Uh, we're going to produce the cost of defence as a two-parter this year. Uh, part one, which has just been released, or is being released today, uh, focuses on the uh, impact of the defence update and the force structure update which was announced by government uh, just a few uh, weeks ago and part two will come uh, further down the track once we have the actual budget released uh, uh, later on in the year so a two-part cost of defence this year uh, what's going to happen here is uh, marcus is going to give us some of the high points from his study uh, and then um, he and I will be on the stage with Catherine, Catherine Zeissen, uh, Managing Director of the Australian Defence Magazine. Welcome, Catherine, and thank you for, uh, for joining us. Uh, we'll have some uh, moderated discussion, uh, some Q&A from the audience, uh, and we'll be wrapping up in about an hour or so. Uh, but without further ado, please welcome to the stage Marcus Hellier, Senior Analyst here at ASPE. Marcus, over to you. Thank you very much, Peter. And uh, I'd also like to thank Cyber Australia for their sponsorship. We aren't holding our usual formal launch event due to the coronavirus, but we still appreciate our partnership with Cyber. I'd also like to draw your attention to ASPE's brand new The Cost of Defence database, which has gone live today. This makes available much of the data relating to the cost of defence that ASPE has collected over the past 19 years and you can access the database through our website. We'll continue to add to it, and we're very happy to take your suggestions on what you'd like to see included in there. And finally, I'd like to thank ASPE's awesome support staff, including Steve Clark, Jerry Cashman, and Kelly Smith, who helped pull the cost of defence together in extremely short timeframes. And in particular, I'd like to thank uh, ASPE Research, Intern Albert Zhang, who has provided invaluable assistance to me in preparing the report and who has borne the brunt of setting up the database. So if it doesn't work, it's Albert's fault. So, uh, all the charts and tables in my slides today are in the cost of defence itself, so if you want a copy of them, just download the report. Okay, nearly a year ago, the Minister for Defence, Linda Reynolds, acknowledged that the world had changed faster than anticipated in the 2016 Defence White Paper. She announced that she had directed Defence to conduct a, quote, thorough reassessment of the strategic underpinnings of the 2016 White Paper and to examine how to adjust our current force structure plan to meet new and rapidly emerging threats. That work was meant to be considered by government early this year. But it's amazing what a bushfire crisis and global pandemic can do to upset your schedule. However, the outcome of that work was made public in uh, early July in the form of the 2020 uh, Defence Strategic Update and its supporting force structure plan. As Peter's foreword to the cost of defence notes, the Defence Strategic Update may not have the title of a white paper, but in terms of content, it has all of the strategic heft of one. It represents a remarkable commitment by the Australian government to sustain growth in the defence budget, as you can see in this slide. The blue columns continue to rise uh, relentlessly towards the right. Released uh, in early July after months of bad economic news caused by the COVID-19 pandemic and growing budget deficits caused by the government's measures to mitigate the economic pain, the DSU nevertheless confirms the robust funding line presented in the 2016 Defence White Paper and extends it for a further four years. So the original White Paper model went out to 25-26. We've gone through four years and so uh, to compensate for that, the new model extends it a further four years out to 
Now, what we can see is that with that sustained growth, that the defence budget will continue to grow past 2% of GDP. So the red line there is a guesstimate of 2% of GDP. Uh, so the government's only put out modelling for 2021 for its GDP forecasts. I've sort of projected a kind of what I'll call a rapid recovery, a fairly optimistic scenario beyond that. And as you can see, um, the defence budget goes well beyond that. So here are some of the, the key numbers uh, from the DSU's uh, funding model. So over the next 10 years, uh, the government will spend $575 billion on defence, so that's a cool half trillion. You know, we're starting to talk real money here. So we go from last year uh, around $39 billion to over $73 billion. And so in terms of nominal growth, so not taking inflation into account, it's over 87%. So the question is, well, what does that mean once you do take inflation into account? And again, just as I'm not really brave enough to model GDP growth, I'm not quite brave enough to model inflation. But if we stick with something resembling what we've had for the last 20 to 30 years, that uh, represents very substantial real growth as well. So that, that number will comfortably outstrip inflation. And uh, because everybody's obsessed with percentages of GDP for the defence budget this year, based on the government's uh, data on GDP, uh, again, that's just using government's money, not my uh, estimate, it's over 2.2%. Of course, if... Uh, you know, the coronavirus woes continue, that number could rise to much, much higher than that. Okay, so the government's making a, a very real and strong commitment to funding defence over the next decade. The question is, well, why did it make that commitment? Well, it's very clear from the defence strategic update that the government is very concerned about Australia's strategic circumstances which it assesses as having deteriorated significantly in the four years since the 2016 White Paper. It states that the region is in the middle of the most consequential strategic realignment since World War II. And indeed, in his launch address, the Prime Minister made an explicit analogy to the collapse of the global order in the 1930s and 1940s and to the existential threat that Australia faced back then. So it is, has certainly gotten the government's attention and that deteriorating environment brings significant uncertainty and risk. And the government regards robust military capabilities as essential to managing that risk. The DSU, in my opinion, marks a, a very clear break from previous high-level strategic statements in the frank way it describes those risks and the new capabilities needed to address them. So it makes several key adjustments to strategic policy settings. It redefines our immediate region as an arc from the Northeast Indian Ocean through maritime and mainland Southeast Asia to Papua New Guinea and the Southwest Pacific. It may be our immediate region, but it's still an extremely large region. We're not talking the traditional air-sea gap of one missile shot out from Darwin. It prioritises the immediate region for defence planning. It introduces the concepts of shape, deter and respond to focused defence planning. And I'd add that the emphasis on shaping reinforces the importance of regional engagement and partnerships in creating a region conducive to our interests. Despite what some analysts have, have said, Australia is not going it alone in this plan. Uh, interestingly, it says a largely defensive force won't def deter attack. Instead, quote, new capabilities are needed to hold adversaries' forces and infrastructure at risk from a greater distance. They include longer range strike weapons, cyber measures, and area denial systems. To use the old phrase, the best defense is a good offense. It acknowledges that Australia can no longer rely on warning times, even for a conventional military attack on Australia and so won't have time to, quote, gradually adjust military capabilities. And finally, it reaffirms the ADF's role in non-war fighting functions, such as disaster relief, as we've seen it do in the recent bushfire crisis, and currently in the response to COVID. 
Now, while the redefinition of the immediate region may not in itself result in changes to the Defence's investment program, the other factors listed here should, and to some extent have, and so we'll now look at some of them. Now, I pointed out that the budget grows dramatically, but one of the key aspects of that is that the growth in the DSU's funding model uh, is centred in the capital budget, and in that way, it continues the pattern of the 2016 white paper. That means the capital component of the budget grows to 40% of the total defence budget and stays there, and that's a far higher percentage than it's uh, historically been at. And by the end of the decade, if the planned increase is achieved, the acquisition component of the budget will have grown by nearly 150% from its starting point in uh, 2019-2020. So it's it's a massive increase in uh, acquisition funding. And despite the broader economic and budget uncertainty, that means that Defence is in the very fortunate position of being able to add some significant new capabilities to its shopping list. Perhaps the most remarkable feature of the four structure plan that accompanied the DSU is that the ADF has entered the age of missiles with a vengeance. There's potentially $100 billion in in investment over the next two decades in missiles and guided weapons. Now, I've got a a list of some of the the larger ones here. That includes the offensive systems needed to deter and defeat an adversary from greater distance, such as hypersonic weapons. And there's specifically a line in there, a line in the, um, the plan to acquire hypersonic weapons. And even the Army is acquiring long-range missiles. There's three funding lines in there for uh, long-range missiles for the Army. But it also includes greatly enhanced defensive systems, such as ballistic missile defence, which is something the defence has considered for a long time but never really previously committed to. And to me, that's a clear sign that uh, the government and defence think the region is getting much more dangerous. The big picture that the update paints is pretty clear. It's one in which the ADF continues its trajectory of steadily fielding improved capability and developing greater strategic weight. But like a beautiful impressionist painting such as Monet's Water Lilies, once you zoom in from the big picture, the details become a little fuzzy. I'm probably not the only one who laments the declining level of detail in successive editions of Defence's investment plan, and I'm sure Catherine will have something to say about that later on. But even considered at the high level, it's clear that there are risks that need to be managed, both in the design of the plan itself and in the implementation of it. And to be fair to Defence, its planning processes are continually improving, along with its costing methodologies. So I suspect that it's likely that these are risks that Defence has already considered in development of the DSU and the force structure plan. Well, the first set of risks relates to the question of whether this is the right force on the right schedule for our deteriorating circumstances. Despite the recognition that Australia can't rely on warning time, much of the planned force is still a long way off in the future. And so the red blobs are things that are already in acquisition. And the two biggest ones uh, up in the sort of top right are the future frigates and the future submarines and uh, they are still a long way away. The future frigate won't be operational for another 10 years, and the future submarine won't be operational for another 14, and then subsequent vessels will only be delivered on a very deliberate two-year drumbeat. So even though I've uh, presented this as, uh, as dots, that dot represents IOC in defence's terminology, so initial operating capability. Actual delivery will be a tail that extends sort of yeah, towards here somewhere. So. Uh, and with the third air warfare destroyer now delivered, the Navy doesn't actually get an additional combat vessel to sea for another decade. And the Air Force, so once it gets its uh, 72 Joint Strike Fighters, which are here, which delivery should be complete around 2023. So after that, um, the Air Force isn't getting additional combat aircraft until towards the end of the decade. Now, most of the major new additions, which are the blue blobs, are also some way off into the future. 
There's a funding line that potentially provides a way forward to get Boeing's loyal wingman, the uh, unmanned aerial vehicle, into service. Which is... Uh, sorry, I can't see it. There we go. Uh, it's in there somewhere. Yeah, we'll just it. <laughs> Second half of the decade, theoretically, uh, Loyal Wingman gets acquisition funding. But, you know, they, taking defence's time scales into account probably close to 2030, maybe, by the time that actually happens. But it is good to see that there is a, a funding path forward for Loyal Wingman. But overall, most of the big buckets of funding for unmanned and autonomous systems uh, don't happen until late into the 2020s or even into the 2030s. So until then, it looks like Defence is relying on improved weapons delivered from existing platforms to provide the main capability enhancement. And to me, it's not quite clear that this is completely consistent with the acknowledgement that we can no longer rely on warning time to, quote, gradually adjust capability. Another factor is that the force envisaged in the Defence Strategic Update and the Force Structure Plan is growing increasingly broad. There are many new capabilities in the plan, but virtually none are being retired or cancelled. Similarly, the range of tasks that the force is being asked to do isn't being reduced either. In fact, the DSU requires greater regional engagement as well as greater capacity for domestic disaster response. But will the force be able to do all of the tasks expected of it? And there's no new investment line for disaster response capabilities such as water bombing aircraft. They may be there at a small scale, but they don't show up and at the high level. Uh, related to this, our changing strategic environment seems to be pulling the force in two directions. The DSU states that we can't match the major power, we can't match major power adversaries and need to develop capabilities that can deter them through strike cyber and area denial systems. So this suggests a growing recognition of the need for asymmetric operational concepts and capabilities. Yet the force is still largely being built around traditional conventional capabilities, such as expensive multi-role man platforms of the kind Australia has always relied upon to overmatch potential adversaries. So again, the, the biggest blobs tend to be your traditional man platforms such as man ships, planes, and uh, things like that, infantry fighting vehicles, for example. Defence is also investing in an increasingly heavy conventional land force with infantry fighting vehicles, self-propelled howitzers, uh, and things like that. Those things are likely to be useful against some potential non-peer adversaries, but I want to ask whether those systems play a deterrent role against a major power adversary, particularly if you have to transport them over increasingly deadly oceans. Then we get to the question of the balance between acquisition, sustainment, and personnel funding. As we noted, acquisition share of the budget is growing rapidly. So in the slide here, it's that light green line there. So it sort of hovered slightly over 30% for the last five or six years. Then it's going to rise up to 40% and sit there. On the other hand, personnel funding uh, decline for, as a percentage of the overall budget. In absolute terms, personnel funding is actually growing, but as a relative percentage of the total, it's shrinking. The DSU states that the government will consider increases to defence workforce next year. But those numbers are already built into the D D DSU's personnel funding stream, suggesting that any additional people won't change the overall trajectory of personnel share of the budget. Now, certainly increased capital spending is necessary if you want to buy new things, but one asks, is a ongoing 40, 26 personnel, uh, the acquisition personnel balance feasible in the long term? There's no point acquiring all that equipment if you haven't got the people to crew it. And I'd also note that capital spending has stagnated over a little over 30% in uh, the last few years. So th this kind of valley here was the 2012-13 the hit where previous Labor government cut defence funding as it desperately tried to get back into surplus. 
And then it steadily recovered, but it sort of plateaued out here. And so you've got a question of, and we're going to look at this a little later, is, is will it actually be able to grow? You know, you've got the money, but can you actually spend it? Okay. Um, the other risks, so the other risks relate to the feasibility of delivery. So the first, as always, is money. So the economic future of both Australia and the world is still very uncertain. If the economic impact of COVID-19 results in prolonged stagnation, it's going to take sustained resolve by this and future governments to keep increasing defence funding over the decade. And should that resolve waver and a future government revert to something like 2% of GDP, that would be a huge hit to the defence budget of potentially five to $10 billion per year. So here I've uh, mapped out, that's the DSU's funding line. This is a kind of uh, guesstimate of what 2% of GDP would look like. And as you can see, 2% of GDP falls short of the DSU funding line by $10 billion a year. So if a future government says 2% and not a penny more, that's a $10 billion a year hit. That's a lot of capability. It's probably you know, three times the cost of the government's uh, local shipbuilding plan on an annual basis, for example. So you would, defence would lose a lot of capability if that happened, or it couldn't acquire a lot of new capabilities. Now, the government has already stated that it's committed to defence's mega projects, so submarines, frigates, armoured vehicles, and the F-35. And they are not part of any prioritisation or trade-off process. So if you do need to find savings, uh, it will be other things that bear the brunt of any funding here. And those are potentially the new asymmetric capabilities that I've mentioned, which are being introduced to deter a major power adversary. And then there's a the very difficult question of the affordability of the force. As we've seen, the defence budget is growing substantially, but so is the list of capabilities that defence is acquiring to sustain, all those new blue blobs on the previous chart. And the acquisition cost of military capabilities grows much faster than inflation in the broader economy. And since 2016, several key capabilities have grown significantly in cost, such as submarines, frigates and armoured vehicles, and as well as some other things such as air defence. And here I've sort of briefly listed some of the key changes in the budget lines between 2016 and 2020, and some of them are quite substantial. And that's in addition to the new entries to the plan, which come on top of those things that were already in the plan. And similarly, uh, sustainment costs are increasing rapidly as well. And so I've uh, guesstimated again, uh, sorry, a few increases in sustainment costs. So submarines, I think, will be about at least three times as much as they are now. Frigates will likely at least double. Uh, air combat could potentially triple. And the cost of armoured vehicles per year could um, increase tenfold. So there's some serious uh, calls on that, that increased funding. But one of the biggest implementation risks relates to Australian industry's ability to scale up to deliver that future force. So the local share of Defence's capital equipment spending has consistently hovered around one third of the total. So Defence spends buys about one-third of its equipment in Australia and two-thirds goes overseas. And that really hasn't changed even since the government's defence industry policy came out in 2016. So last year, that meant around $2.6 billion was spent here on military equipment. Now, as we've noted, the total defence budget is growing uh, rapidly. Capital investment share of that is uh, also growing. And the government, as uh, Minister Reynolds said here at ASPE last week, expects Australian industry's share of that capital investment to grow as well. So when you uh, stack all of those three things on top of each other, you get uh, a picture uh, like this. So where we go from uh, about $2.6 billion a year 
And even to stay, so the blue line here is Australian industry staying at around about a third. So not increasing that proportion at all. So just trying to stay at, at one third and you get to over $7 billion a year uh, acquisition spend here. But if you want to increase that share to 40 to 50%, then you um, get up to somewhere around about $10 billion a year. So four times what we're spending right now. So that's a, that's a big elephant for our Australian industry to swallow. But if we don't do it, and if we, if we can't get there, the government won't achieve the level of sovereign capability that it's seeking and will continue to rely on imported systems with the associated supply chain risk. And as we've seen through the COVID crisis, supply chain risks are very real. And I'll also add to this picture that currently two thirds of um, defence's sustainment spend, so looking after the things it has already and repairing them, so two thirds of the sustainment spend is already spent locally. Uh, even if that uh, percentage doesn't grow, it'll, it'll hit $16 billion a year by the end of the decade as the overall sustainment budget grows. So sustainment total is meant to grow to about 25 billion, so two thirds of that will be 16. So if we take $10 billion in acquisition spending and $16 billion in sustainment spending, so Aussie industry will have to absorb $25 billion a year. So it's a very large elephant for Australian industry to swallow. And so while I think the basic settings of the government's 2016 defence industry policy statement, which it put out as part of the white paper, are the right settings, it's likely it's going to have to do more to, to develop the kind of local industrial ecosystem necessary to deliver the level of sovereign capability that the defence strategic update is uh, talking about. Relying on the local assembly of foreign designs using mainly foreign high-value subsystems isn't going to get us there. More needs to be done to generate technological innovation and advanced manufacturing here in Australia. However, there are only minor increases to innovation funding in the DSU, for example. Innovation programs are still less than half a percent of defence's total budget. It's not the kind of spending you'd ex expect to see in a high-tech organisation on R&D. Now, there is in the four structure plan a, a, a new line for a billion dollars to develop sovereign weapons manufacturing. And that could be a model for a more deliberate approach to generating sovereign industrial capability. So I'll be very interested to see uh, how that line goes. But I think it's a model for what the government needs to be doing to develop uh, industrial and R&D capability more broadly. Okay, and the final point I'm going to make is that the other risk associated with industry policy is the old one of falling into the trap of preferring industrial outcomes to military capability. And to some extent, that risk has already been realised. Some of the hidden costs of continuous build programs are becoming more apparent. The four structure plan states as I have here, the cost, that the cost increase for the Future Freedom Program, which has gone from $30 billion in the 2016 plan to $45 billion in the 2020 plan, uh, so roughly a 50% increase. So the FSP states that the cost increase was caused by the government allocating, quote, additional funding to enable construction of ships at a deliberate drumbeat over a longer period of time than originally planned to achieve a continuous shipbuilding program. In plain English, what we're saying is we're deliberately paying more to get capability later. Now, the DSU acknowledges that we can no longer rely on warning time to be able to, quote, gradually adjust military capability. So surely now's the time to be spending to accelerate delivery and the rate at which we adjust capability, not spending to slow it down. If we're willing to pay a premium to build here, Let's pay to get more capability sooner, not later. Why are we prioritising jobs for future generations of shipbuilders over capability for current servicemen and women who may be called upon to use it in anger in the near future? So to conclude, the new strategy has been written. The government uh, is most certainly understands the urgency driving its defence policy changes 
The key question is whether the defence can sufficiently internalise the urgency to implement the changes needed in how the organisation does business. Linda Reynolds, the Minister for Defence, here at ASPE stated last week that, quote, the Defence Department has systematically for over 100 years failed to deliver on the government's expectations of the enterprise. So we now have a plan that calls for speed, lateral thinking, innovation and partnerships to be implemented by an organisation known to be slow, subject to group, think, risk averse and reluctant to reach out. To me, one of the biggest risks will be adapting defence to the demands of our new uh, reality. Thank you very much, and we'll uh, move to panel discussion. Well, Marcus, thank you very much, and um, Yes, I, uh, uh, Linda Reynolds' comments uh, on our uh, virtual conference of 100 years of uh, failed delivery must, must surely have stunned a little uh, in, in the Defence Department. It was definitely a very pointed statement that she made. Um, I wanted to start um, in talking with the two of you about the, uh, the industry picture uh, because the, the picture that Marcus has really painted is um, a story of transfer of a huge amount of money into an industry sector um, at a time when the, the wider economy is uh, actually suffering very deeply from COVID and, and is likely to continue to suffer for some, some period of time. What's your assessment? I'll go to Marcus first, that you can talk about the, the capacity of industry to be able to absorb this. Um, is, is this really the beginning of a sort of a state-led reconstruction plan, you might say, for the Australian economy in the post-COVID world? Um, and where are the, um, the blockages going to be uh, where, where it comes to industry's capacity to sort of meet that um, expectation? Yeah, look, it's a great point. Um, I think, you know, COVID has really exposed broader um, supply, chain, supply chain challenges in Australia more broadly. There's a lot of thinking going on about uh, what we do about that. There's a big realisation that we have uh, lead manufacturing capabilities really decline across the board in the country. You know, on the one hand, um, the defence sector has a four-year head start uh, because of the 2016 policy statement. On the other hand, as I mentioned, you look at that, you look at the data, it hasn't really increased its share uh, beyond about a third over the last four years. You know, it's, it is an example of the ocean liner having to slowly turn, so these things don't occur overnight. But I think, you know, one of the issues with, uh, you know, conservative governments tend to take a fairly hands-off approach. You know, they, um, there are elements in both the original um, defence industry policy and the DSU of money to help, you know, industry capability, but it tends to be in the few million dollars here, a few million dollars there. Uh, when If you want to um, push literally tens of billions of dollars through that pipeline, I think you do have to build a bigger pipe and you do have to do it deliberately. So I do think the government, you know, even, even though it may not be its happy place of actually you know, engineering industrial capability, I think it's going to have to take a much more proactive approach to building that industry capability. And as um, a number of us here at ASPE have said many times, fundamental to that is uh, investment in R&D. I know, you know the government is a little sceptical or, or suspicious of investment in R&D. If you give scientists money, they'll just go off and you know, waste it on their own crazy ideas. But you know, I would add that you know, if the atomic bomb did come through a bit of you know, science experimenting. So, you know, I think scientists can actually deliver real military capability. And so I'd like to see a lot more investment in universities, as you've written about, and in R&D in general, because I think you can't just sit back and let it evolve by itself. You know, we're not going to get there by through Aussie Steel. You know, no matter how much steel you use, it's still less than a percent of the total budget of defence projects. I don't think you can even sit back and say, all right, well, we'll build uh, overseas designs here, we'll assemble them here, 
that's not going to get us there because you're you know not going to crack you know 50 to 60 percent local industry content um, on those designs. So you know, I think a much more proactive uh, approach is needed. What's your take? Uh, look, I think there's an appetite within Australian industry to step up. Um, there is a capacity issue, obviously. Uh, also because the barriers to entry for defence are quite high. So going through the DISP framework to get your clearances to move into this space uh, can be hard. So obviously the CDIC is on hand to help with that, but that's a body that's being reviewed at the moment uh, by government because of its past performance, I would say. The other thing is, it was meant to be a magic pudding. Um, when then Defence Minister Christopher Pine announced it, uh, if you're down, go to CDIC. Uh, but they were not funded and resourced, I think, to deal with the, the flood of demand that they got. I think there will be consolidation within the defence industry over the coming months and years. Um, as as Marcus mentioned, I think COVID has been a, a really uh, blunt and sudden lesson in what fragility looks like. Um, I spoke recently with John Blackburn and Senator David Fawcett on our podcast about some of the resiliency issues that Australia faces in the defence industry and also at a, a, a higher national level as well. And there are so many interconnected issues when it comes to our supply chain that I don't think we can do it on our own. We do need to be more resilient and that is not something defence is going to do on its own. It needs to be a whole of government approach. Um, and the current government and also the opposition have not been big on digging winners. And, and the structure of our defence industry is quite unique as well, as much as we have a large number of really small companies which yep. struggle to scale up yep. um, and which don't necessarily have the capacity to meet the demands of the prime that we're talking about, mm -hmm. you know, major support. How do we deal with that situation? Is this a, are we going to go into a period of amalgamations and consolidation across industry? What, what's the way out of it? I think so. Look, we've um, there's been quite a bit of analysis done on how our defence industry is structured. So we have a lot of foreign-owned prime with locally owned subsidiaries. So nine out of the ten companies in ADM's top 40 are foreign-owned. So they report to a home office in Europe or um, in America. The only company in there in the top ten is ASC, which is government-owned. Um, and in the last 12 months. ASC shipbuilding is now under the auspices of BA Systems Australia. It remains to be seen what that middle chunk will be able to do. So in Australia, once you're an SME, um, which is up to 200 full-time equivalent people, once you hit that point, support stops. So you had access to a whole bunch of grants and programs and R&D support and tax breaks uh, and various levels of support from both the federal and state government. But once you hit that magic number, it's gone. So there is actually no incentive for companies to go above about 200 FTE. The growing pains get too hard, the financials become too hard. Um, and I don't think we actually have a good strategy for how to get over that valley of death when it comes to growing the middle. There is such a massive gap between SMEs and primes that I have not seen a plan that would address that in a meaningful way. Now, another factor in this, Catherine, is the, um, is, is the pipeline of trained individuals that are able to be recruited by mm -hmm. companies being small. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, speaking to uh, one of those uh, senior uh, top 10 CEOs just, just recently, uh, mm -hmm. the observation was made to me, it's about half of the uh, university graduate um, outflow essentially can't be recruited by Australian right. defence companies because they're unlikely to get security and clearances. Right. So let me put to both of you your, to get your views. To, I mean, have, have we designed a defence plan now which is simply not going to be able to find people necessary to deliver it at the industry level, let alone what we need inside the defence organisation? Well, I, I'm not an expert on workforce, but everything I've heard sort of echoes those kinds of comments. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, if you want a you know skilled uh, engineer who can integrate complex systems to go onto a, a ship, you know, that it's not simply a matter of taking somebody out of high school and giving them a four-year engineering degree. So, you know, it takes years of 
of education and on the job training to develop, develop those skills, just as it takes years to develop the skilled people to use those systems. So, um, it, again, it, I think it is a, a, an ocean liner that will take a long time to turn around, and I'm not sure it's going to turn around in the amount of time we've got available that you know, sketched out shown there. So if, if we do spend that money, I suspect we will end up defaulting to buying uh, overseas systems, which in, in some ways is what we've always done. So it may not be a terrible capability outcome if you're trying to get capability sooner, but it won't develop, like, like, I guess, the kind of deep sovereign capability you need to support um, those systems. Look, the, the pipeline of STEM students coming through the Australian system is not fit for purpose. Um, all engineers are not created equal. Um, and as you say, clearance is a massive problem in our space. They just are. There's no getting around that. And I don't think there is any appetite to loosen uh, that either. But I think there is scope to maybe look at the classification levels of some of the technologies that we're working with and perhaps think, can this be done in a civil environment? Is a COTS product, commercial off the shelf, perhaps applicable for what we're doing and how we're doing it? Does it have to be military off the shelf? Um, obviously, the, the other issue here is, is cyber as well. Cyber is being baked into every single major program that we're looking at these days. Um, the government released their new cyber strategy last week, which interestingly it was through home affairs. It was not a defence-led program. Um, there is a lot of money going into cyber. But what does cyber look like? Um, we, we talk about it a lot, but what does it mean in practice? How are we protecting our systems? How are we getting on the front foot? Um, my biggest concern is not people that bash metal, it's people that move with ones and zeros. I, I still think a critical deficiency is the uh, lack of sufficient medieval study students coming through. <laughs> yeah. Into, uh, oh, oh, yeah, oh, definitely. definitely. Let me move on to a different area. This is something you've been quite uh, strong about over a number of years now. It's been arguing for an update to the integrated investment program, uh, particularly around the, 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 the um, level of detail of information that's provided. How do the current new policy documents sort of meet up to what your expectations were for, for that type of transparency? Yeah, so anyone who has ever read anything I've ever written, uh, you will be familiar with my hobby horse when it comes to this one. I like to get out and write it at every opportunity. Um, because the integrated, integrated investment program is defence's shopping list. What we're going to do, how we're going to do it, how it all fits together. And it has not been publicly updated in over four years now. For a living document that was meant to have six monthly updates, and has internally, um, this has not been communicated well to industry. There are lots of different forums. There are environmental working group briefs. Uh, there are Oztender industry briefs. There are lots of different ways that industry can get information, which is really great if you have a lot of people that you can spread around. If you have someone that can do the big strategy piece for your business, great. If you're a prime and you've got a couple of hundred people under your belt, sure, you have the ability to do that. If you're an SME, it's tough. It's really tough. You have no flippant hope of getting your head around everything that's going on. There needs to be a single point of truth. And I think there is an appetite out there for an IIP, which is a living document, which does have those caveats of subject to change. I think industry is mature enough to look at a planning document and go, right, this is where we want to go, this is what we want to do. But things are subject to change. Um, you know, Marcus is more aware than I am. The shell game that happens when defence budget uh, defence budgets are released, is remarkable. So if you look at the portfolio budget statements, you have half a billion dollars contingency. So anywhere between 500 million and 750 million, I think is probably the biggest I've seen, of contingency funding where they shift programs around because they haven't met milestones. Something's moved to the left, something's moved to the right. Um, there are entire departments that can run on the contingency for a decade. Yeah. I mean, and that's our Google group. Industry understand that plans change. I mean, they have their own investment plans which constantly change. So, you know, it doesn't worry them that if plans if plans change, they just want to know how they're changing. I mean, I think it's interesting that you know, Defence has been working on this update for a year and a half. Okay, 
And having been involved in similar processes in defence, I can tell you that the development of the, the public, the outward face, so the strategic update and the, the public core structure plan would have come right at the end when everybody's exhausted. You do the minimum to tick that box, and you're terrified that if you say too much, you'll get in trouble from the minister's office or from you know, the secretary's office or from somewhere. You know, so you deliberately say as little as you can uh, so you don't get in trouble, also to keep your options open down as you go down the track so no one can accuse you of, of saying you were going to get one thing and you end up getting something else. So everything kind of compounds to say as little as possible. Well, you know, and I just find it remarkable that one of the key elements of the 2016 industry policy statement was the very clear statement of industry as a partner, of industry as a fit, as a fundamental input to capability, of talk about cultural change in the way that defence works with industry, and yet again and again, it's not sort of backed up by reality, such as these kinds of documents. And as Catherine said, the uh, the 2016 white paper said there will be frequent updates to the investment plan. There was not a single one in the four and a half years until the four structure plan came out. Well, and also in defence, um, of defence in this case, um, the force design team behind all the cost analysis and estimation has just been awarded the International Cost Estimation and Analysis Association uh, Award for the best team for their work in 2019. So this is a group of people, I think, led by Brigadier Chris Mills, uh, who have been internationally recognised for their work on these two policy documents. So it's probably the best costed document which has ever come out but what is publicly available still kind of sucks a little bit. Um, and when I asked the minister at your own event, you know, when am I going to get a publicly updated INIP, um, I'm pretty sure she rolled her eyes so hard at me that they were going to fall out of her head. But also, what more do you want? Why will I just send what I wanted? I want an updated INIP. I want a coherent document that has all the programs, that has all the projects has bands, that has all the numbers, that fits the puzzle together in a single point of truth. So when we see, as we have in the defence update, for example, submarines and a number of other major projects moves out of one band into another higher band of cost mm -hmm. estimate over the decade ahead, what, what do you read into that? What, what does that tell you in terms of the dynamics of what defence is trying to do? Does that help industry plan its uh, life any more effectively? Well, I, I don't think, you know, so the submarine's moving from 50 billion to 89 billion. I don't think that industry particularly get anything out of that. I think what greater granularity across the program would be helpful. So, for example, when I was working on doing the cost of defence, there's a chapter there, chapter four, which basically looks at what's changed. What's changed from the 2016 plan to the 2020 plan? It was actually the hardest, most time-consuming chapter of the lot, just trying to baseline fundamental details. So when a paragraph in 2016 says this and it says something in 2020, are they actually talking about the same thing? Because Defence no longer uses project numbers for anything, doesn't use project names, and so it's, it's very hard to just simply say, is this, is this an apple and this an apple? You know, and so I think that's kind of what industry is really after, is, actually having granularity about what are we actually talking about. Mm -hmm. So something that very unambiguously has changed um, uh, is the emphasis on missiles. Uh, missile acquisition, mm -hmm. missile construction, missile sustainment. As you said, tens of billions of dollars over the course of the decade. Marcus, why? What's the strategy here? Uh, and what are the production and sustainment? Well, so the, the capability discussion is there's a number of things going on here. One is that, to me, the, the kind of industry standard for missiles is just improving. So our Navy's current ships have half-moon on them, anti-ship missile, that maybe you know, has a range of 100 kilometres or so. Um, but if you're going to war against people who have uh, missiles with a range of 1,000 kilometres, you're taking a very small knife to a, a gunfight. So a lot of it is simply uh, upgrading existing capabilities. But I think there is also a real attempt there to, uh, you know, as I said, um, have greater range to be able to deny um, enemy access to essentially raise the cost to them 
you know, so essentially pushing our effective range further out, and that requires different kinds of missiles, such as hypersonics. Uh, and I, again, I think that is a good thing. I think that the real issue is defence, and I sort of hinted at it in the, in the talk, is defence is still kind of wedded to platforms, <clears throat> but it also wants the range that come with missiles. And so it's like, well, what's the role of the platform still? And that's where most of your investment is still going. And so, for example, um, you know, if we take air warfare destroyers and the current ANZAC frigates, there's not actually much room on those platforms to put new missiles on you know, because they don't have a lot of launch cells and the launch cells that are there are already uh, taken up by air defence missiles. So I think, the, you know, um, you know, my good colleague Michael Shoebridge has said a number of times, you know, he likes where this is going, but this is the sort of first iteration of the new force structure plan. So I think there's a lot of kind of rethinking going on in defence, just as there is in, say, the US Defence Department of, you know, what's the role of traditional manned platforms now if you're trying to, say, stop China invading Taiwan? How do you actually get your manned platforms close enough to make a difference? You know, and so um, do you then adopt your own kind of denial capabilities and essentially reflect back on China what it's doing with its you know, famous A2, AD capabilities? And so I think there's a lot of kind of <clears throat> rethinking going on there. But again, this is another area where you're trying to turn around a huge ocean liner in terms of defence's traditional happy place of expensive manned platforms. and. How, what role are they going to play in the future? So, um, worth thinking also about time frames here. Um, I was doing one of the things you do in the think tank, which was looking at the numbers of defence ministers we've had since King Beasley's uh, 1987 defence white paper, the first one we sort of engaging with. 15 is the answer, 15 defence ministers in over three decades. So one thing we can say with a degree of certainty in the life of this document, even just looking at the first 10 years, there's likely to be a change of government that is almost inevitably going to be changes of minister. Catherine, how does that impact, in your view, on the sort of sustainability of the policies? Oh, look, I think publicly, um, you know, the party line is carried. Um, so if the current government stays the same, regardless of the person sitting in the Defence Minister's chair, I think while this government's in power, we're fairly safe. Um, a change of government would obviously um, give a chance to review what's happening and how it's happening. So uh, the Deputy Leader and Shadow Defence Minister Richard Miles gave a speech earlier this month at the National Press Club saying that the Labor Party was the uh, traditional defence leader, uh, which I thought was an interesting comment to make uh, considering their decision history over the last two decades in particular. Um, and it was also the first time I think the opposition has come out and made a political comment on one of the, the, the mega programs, so the future submarine. Um, and it will be interesting to see how defence is treated during the next election. Uh, traditionally, there's not a lot of votes in it unless the world is going to hell in the handbasket. Um, and at the moment, it, it kind of is. Um, so I am confident that turning around the liner will be difficult, but I think that a change of government will probably introduce another element of uncertainty for defence industry. Now, I've got two more questions for you, and I, I want them to finish by going to Michael Shubridge, who I know is desperate to ask something for both of you. Um, let, let me just quickly get your takes, take on these, these questions here. Um, you, you, you sort of ended in your speech on this point, Marcus, about, okay, so the strategy has been written in the government's process. What needs to happen now, of course, is a fairly big, I, I would think, a fairly big set of cultural changes inside the defence organisation in terms of what that. What has to change? Well, if, you know, if I could answer that, then probably, you know, somebody over the last 100 years would have you know, answered that themselves. So it's a difficult issue. It's, it's a difficult issue. I mean, you know, it's interesting, a um, slightly different answer is, okay, let's take um, the Chief of Air Force. 
program. So the chief of air force is essentially chosen from a pool of people who entered the defence force 30 years earlier, 35 years earlier. And so a number of young primary Australians want to become pilots because you have to be a pilot to be chief of air force. And you know, essentially each year, air force generates 45 pilots. Maybe half of them become fighter pilots, and generally. You know, you have to be a fighter pilot to be chief of air force. So each year you've got a pool of 20 people who are your future, you know, leader. And every year that gets whittled down, whittled down, whittled down. So, you know, I will say that, you know, the chiefs of air force are talented people and I've known many of them and they, they are very talented people. But you have essentially selected, pre-selected your senior leadership 30 years earlier and thoroughly institutionalised them into defence. So if you um, look at other leading organisations around the world, when they look for a CEO, they throw the search open to the entire world. You know? And so um, defence is awesome at replicating itself, and you, know, you see that again and again and again. It's not just at the personnel level, but you look at the, the force structure level. We've basically got the same force structure that was there when I was a kid, you know, as an eight-year-old, totally obsessed with military stuff. You know, it was roughly... The same thing there and so it's a really difficult uh, problem and you know every government has this kind of problem to, to break through. Thank, thank goodness it never happens in the public service though. <laughs> <laughs> like um, Catherine, the last one for you, sort of takeaways for industry from these policy documents, what, what do you think will be the um, outcomes? There's lots of opportunities I think uh, Peter, so every single uh, strategic uh, or sovereign capability has literally a couple of bajillion dollars assigned to it. Um, there is a major drive from government to get more Australian industry involved um, at every single level. And I think that's actually started to permeate within defence. Uh, there is a greater understanding from the desk officer level, one, two, and three stars. More people are getting on board. Uh, but I think there still needs to be more cross-pollination between defence and industry. Um, so I took part in the Defence Industry Study Course, DISC, in 2017, which was fabulous, I have to say. But it was interesting watching some of the uniform members on that course when we did visits out to industry sites. We do this. Oh, my God, we can do that. Why did no one tell me we could do this? because they hadn't been given the opportunity to see it and the industry hadn't been given the opportunity to show it. Um, and so I think there actually is a lot more capability out there than Defence realises. It just may not be in the format that they're used to. Well, maybe the COVID has unleashed uh, an opportunity to be creative, both across industry and Defence and government, which could be a positive thing in there. Michael Shoot, I'm going to give the last question to you here. Thanks, Peter, and thank you, uh, panel. Um, Peter, you don't escape this question as maybe as, as much to you as it is to Marcus and Catherine. And it's really about the disconnect between the front end of the update and the back end of the force structure plan. So early in the update, along with giving Australia greater military power to, do, to deter conflict, there's a statement that the intensity and frequency of disasters in Australia and in the region will demand a higher priority in defence planning. But then I look in the back end of the full structure plan, and I don't see much. There's a new Pacific support ship, uh, but there's nothing like uh, re-rolling reserves or equipping defence with waterborne capability to rolled into the C-17. Uh, do you think that this is a case of there's another shooter drop and that defence is going to be pushed to do more, both by the government and by public expectations? And do you think disaster response as part of shaping our regional environment as much as critical deterrence is? Look, it's a great question, Michael, and uh, I'll, I'll quickly do my two cents with first. I, yeah, yes, I, I think what has perhaps happened here is that Defence is waiting to see what the Royal Commission into the bushfire disaster tells us. Um, and there's at least a possibility that that Royal Commission will say that there are, there are clearly more necessary roles for federal agencies um, and it's very clear that when our government thinks about disasters, just as we've seen with, with COVID, um, it thinks about the Defence Force very early on in that, uh, in that consideration. So more to come. 
Um, and I, I don't think that uh, defence will be able to sustain a line which says that everything we do is going to be done from then our existing high and automotive capabilities. So probably we change with that. What do you guys like? I think I have a slightly different view, Peter, because um, my sense is disaster response is not part of defence's DNA. It is would take you know more of that cultural shift to uh, to change its investment priorities. I think Michael's right in saying when you look at the plan, there is nothing immediately obvious in there about investing in uh, capabilities, particularly for uh, disaster response. So there's no you know water bombing aircraft or anything like that. And I'll note that um, when the Minister was here the day after the launch of the DSU, she did say that there's an expectation that Defence will do more of that, but then she specified, but not at the cost of traditional war fighting capability. So again, it's that kind of, you know, stretching the rubber band further, wanting to do more with the same force. And, you know, one of the things I've said is, well, the problem with that approach of, you know, Defence will do disaster response, but it's going to use its traditional inherent warfighting capabilities to do it, is that, well, then you take your MRH-90 helicopter, which is, you know, built to military specs with military systems, the annual, when you look at the annual cost of that, it works out at about $25,000 an hour. Well, the New South Wales Rural Fire Service can, you know, have, enter into long-term contracts with helicopter companies that work out at, you know, $2,000 an hour. So you're spending, you know, 10 times as much for a military system. And then you use up all its flying hours in, in the, well, fire season and you know you haven't got it available for you know your um exercise to train the war fighting capability so my view is is if there is an expectation that defense is gonna this is going to be part of defense's core business then you do actually need to start not just sort of training for it but actually for structuring for it you know and one of the things we've sort of uh, written about here at ASCII is we've sort of suggested maybe the army reserve could you know that could become a you know, the primary function of the Army Reserve is a kind of disaster response force. There is a line in here for recapitalizing the reserves, but then, you know, it's a water lilies kind of entry, it's all pretty vague, and there the term is, you know, in enhancing its warfighting capability. So it doesn't really seem to be about, you know, refashioning the reserve to be that kind of emergency response force. So, you know, I, I, I would agree with you and, and say it's pretty open at the moment. But again, I think it would take a fundamental change to defence's kind of culture or DNA to, you know, address this properly. Okay. Look, I, I think defence has been responding to humanitarian aid and disaster relief missions since it began. Um, I think we're quite used to seeing soldiers, sailors, airmen and women in uniform on the ground doing cool stuff to help out our population and also that in the region. Um, you know, the, the bushfires this year, COVID, uh, any time there's any kind of cyclone or hurricane in the region, uh, we send supplies, we send people. I think some of the biggest issues are probably around capacity. So if there are such issues happening uh, while, you know, the world falls apart uh, in a war fighting sense, then we have trouble. But there are, I think, a number of capabilities that were outlined um, in the recent policy documents that support the hate mission that Defence is asking to do. So there are more army craft for riverine. Uh, I would like to see comm systems in this space get a really good update um, because we have communication systems that don't talk to civil systems particularly well. Uh, so that coordination role, particularly at the regional level, I think needs to be addressed. Uh, because we have to set up a whole new network every time we bloody go somewhere. Um, but we will continue to do the hate emissions, I think, to the best of our ability, and that ability is quite impressive. It's probably not always cost-effective, um, but it does the job. Listening to Robert Glasser speaking on the climate change at a conference, a virtual conference today, one gets the impression that there's going to be more of on the idea of doing more of this in our region. Robert, particularly touches on Southeast Asia, where I think a confluence of circumstances suggests that that's going to be not very much, you know, as big a demand as indeed potentially high-end war, war fighting. So plenty, plenty more to think about in that, in that space.
Uh, Marcus, congratulations on part one. Now you can get started on part two. <laughs> Catherine, thank you very much for coming and sharing your thoughts with us as always. Uh, it's been great talking to you all. And I hope those of you who are watching online tune in for the last couple of conference sessions which are going to happen um, this week. Uh, and then very soon after that, I'll be able to announce a really big interview that Stan Grant is going to be making with a leader in the Asia Pacific region. I'm not going to say quite who yet, but he'll knock your socks off, so stay tuned for that. Thanks very much for tuning in today. Thank you.